Next up, we're going to have Anuradha Reddy, um, who's going to talk us about naughty, naughty hardware, um, talking about crochet as a medium. Hi, Anu. Hello. Um, let me share my screen. Is my second screen visible? All right, um, I think my screen is visible now. Can everyone hear me? Yes, okay. Um, all right, uh, sorry for the delay. Um, thank you, uh, everyone. Um, so let's just begin. Um, so um, I am Anuradha Reddy. Um, I am a design researcher, so I'm a postdoc uh, a researcher in the field of interaction design, and I live in Sweden, and I work at Malmö University. Um, and I also teach, uh, I've been teaching for six years now, and I also make things. Um, and uh, the things that I make uh, are both uh, as a part of my research and also things that I make outside of my work. But uh, recently, these uh, kind of worlds have been colliding, and I've come to start making um, uh, things that are naughty, but also naughty, like playful. So the things that I make are like these. They look like something like this. And um, uh, yeah, and so in this presentation, I'll talk about these three designs that I've made and that I have in the past, and I have uh, been able to certify them as open source hardware. Uh, what brings these three designs together is uh, in this little serpent's key triangle of mine is uh, uh, yarn, uh, which is my main material, crochet being my medium, and my approach being computational thinking. Um, and I, I will talk about all three of them. Uh, let's start with yarn. So my first kind of provocation is that yarn is hardware. And to kind of allude to um, what uh, Ashley Jane Lewis said in the keynote, uh, that we need to look uh, learn from our past, right? So let's look at two examples from our history. So the first example I want to bring, or the first instance I want to bring up, is um, the, the, the time when uh, NASA uh, brought women into the labor workforce uh, for sending uh, software into for, for the NASA space missions, like Apollo space missions. And these were called the little, uh, the, the community of women were called little old ladies and they were brought into the factories because they had really great skills for weaving. Um, and um, the other example is um, the Navajo carpet weaving community uh, where uh, Fairchild Semiconductors, this industries had created a, a plant in Shiprock in Mexico. And um, they also brought these women into the workforce because they wanted their expert weaving skills. And if you can see in the image, you can see the resemblance between the carpet weaving, the kind of knowledge and the patterns that they are kind of in it, like that the community had were directly kind of, you know, uh, printed on what we call hardware or circuit boards today. So you can see that how what we say, what we call hardware is that we are deeply indebted to the kind of knowledge and our understanding of, it depends on our understanding of yarn. Um, so the other provocation I want to bring up is that yarn is programmable. And here I want to shout out to a physicist, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Matsumoto. Um, she talks about how uh, knitting is coding and that yarn is programmable. So what she says is that uh, with every stitch that you make, um, you can actually exploit 
of the mathematical and mechanical properties of yarn, you can take advantage of its material. So she uses knot theory to kind of understand biologically in inspired engineering and mathematics. And so what she says is that you can encode certain kinds of logic and information and ideas by using certain kinds of knots, right? And she also says something that uh, that uh, knitting or you know working with yarn is also very similar to like using binaries ones and zeros, but it also goes beyond that in a way because um, you know yarn can also do much more you know more three dimensional things. You can talk about the floofiness of yarn, uh, which is kind of difficult to talk if you're talking only in binaries. But uh, for now, let's just stay with the binaries, right? Uh, because that's where we can get playful with it. So here we can see on the right, there's a sweater. This is called the SOS sweater by Dr. Kristen Herring. Um, she found, she talks about in her, in her um, uh, talk about um, media history, she talks about, she, she talks about media history through, her, through an example of kind of translating two kinds of things, Morse code to binaries, right? So here you can see how she takes uh, something that's written uh, in Morse code into uh, dots and dashes converted into ons and offs and into binaries and into nits and poles. So P is uh, Pearl and K are, is a knit. Um, so the idea is that, th is that you can basically work with two different kinds of systems um, and, and the result can be really interesting. So for example, in the sweater, um, so in the center, the, 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 in, uh, along the center, you can see the SOS. Um, when, when someone, when you ask an, a person who knows how to knit and you tell them this is actually a Morse code, they might say, no, no, this is a rib knit. Um, and, and they say like, you know, that this is exactly what we do. This is a rib knit. So you can see that actually, uh, our worlds that we are actually doing pretty much same things, but we don't actually talk to each other so much. So we don't realize the overlaps. And, and I think that there, there is a lesson to be learned in thinking about our practices about hardware and programming in a very interdisciplinary fashion. Um, and I think it can also lend to a better user experience. Um, so what does this have to do with crochet, right? So I think crochet is different because crochet, it doesn't deal with binaries alone, right? It's actually a series of knots, uh, different kinds of knots and a crochet pattern looks very much like this. Um, and I think crochet is interesting and challenging because there are no ones and zeros here. There is, for example, for weaving, you have weaving, like you have like the jacquard looms, some kind of automation there. For you have knitting machines and you have embroidery machines, but for crochet, it's just, you know, doing something repetitively with your hand, which is, I think, more challenging and also quite rewarding. And I think from, I, I, I feel it's like the closest you can come to 3D printing with your own hands. Um, and it's otherwise, popularly known as amigurumi, which is like about making toys, soft toys. But uh, I mean, if you think about it in a different way, what you're doing is also 3D printing. Um, and I think it's also very slow, it's repetitive and it's therapeutic in a sense that it can also be deeply empowering. You can make interesting commentaries on something that's extremely digital, our priorities and values about efficiency and uh, yeah, things being fast and so on. Um, so I think it is a really, it, it really counters our uh, yeah, uh, needs for efficiency quite nicely. Um, and yeah, and this is kind of what I call crafting computational thinking. So the idea is that you can take any two domains and uh, try to remix them. So you can take any element that's from one domain and try to map it onto another domain. And hopefully when you do that, I mean, it is definitely challenging. Like you can take two domains that are very close to each other, say like knitting and crochet, or it can be really far apart. And the farther apart the domains are, the more difficult it becomes and the more challenging it becomes, but also very exciting because when you do hit that sweet spot, it's actually quite a joyful and rewarding experience. And I will talk about the three projects where I think I hit some sweet spots. Um, so the first is the resistor cushion, right? Um, so resistor cushion combines two worlds. So the first world is of yarn and the other one is of electronic components, particularly resistors. So uh, in the yarn world, uh, we have needles. We have, uh, you know, we have uh, needles which are really sharp, which are pointy, and we have a solution for that, which is the pin cushions, right? But in the electronic world, we also have things that are really pointy and sharp, but uh, we don't have any place where we can put them un until, unless we put them back in, the, in that little box. 
Um, so I, I created something called resistor cushions. Um, also because both uh, both yarn and resistors have this color color coding or yarn can be put into different colors. And another reason why this is kind of interesting is because um, yeah, like uh, resistors can be really hard to see, uh, especially if you know you're slightly visually impaired or yeah, you you you're having trouble. So then you can also see it in a bigger size. So yeah, so this can, this becomes a practical product that anybody anybody can make and use. Um, and the second project is um, the world of yarn combined with uh, digital key encryption. So um, this project kind of reflects on the like you know our lives where we are now losing you know physical objects and we are more like doing kind of digital key recognitions with like facial recognition or like fingerprint recognition. Um, so I kind of wanted to counter that through yarn. Uh, so I was basically inspired by a yarn called Crypto. And this uh, crypto yarn uh, was uh, is was is basically just a variegated yarn, right? Like it means a multicolored yarn. And I went back to what Dr. Matsumoto said, right? So with every stitch that you make, you can actually encode or encrypt a certain logic into a device. So and and I knew that if I may if I crocheted um, uh, keys like keys that are just amigurumi toy keys. Each of them would actually be unique um, because no two keys will be the same because you know the yarn has a special colored pattern, and I knew that I could use that for my you know for any kind of security detection. So I used machine learning to kind of teach my machine to recognize these keys, and then later I ported it into Raspberry Pi so I could securely create a, my own smart home security system. Right. Um, so um, so the, this is the second project and. The last project is the Internet of Towels. And in this project, uh, it combines the world of yarn and lenticular images uh, and QR codes. So um, lenticular, lenticular techniques are basically um, illusion techniques. Um, they were, and so today we see them in toys, like you know, the toys that uh, where you, if, you, if you tilt the toy, you can see a different image. Um, and you can try out these kind of techniques in different uh, mediums. So, for example, you can make it in paper, you can make it in crochet or knitting. It's called shadow knitting or crochet. So I thought, how, what, what if I can hide a secret message in a crochet towel? So, um, and then I kind of tried to do the lenticular technique in QR code. I made a QR code pattern uh, on Microsoft Excel um, um, because, yeah, uh, why not? Um, and I crocheted this towel it took me 30 days um, and I'm probably not gonna try it out again but I would say it's, it was a pretty interesting process so this towel when you look at it from the top you don't see any kind of yeah it's kind of like an abstract pattern when you tilt it it's a QR code and currently this QR code links back to a tutorial uh, links back to the documentation for how to make an internet of towels uh, object um, and, and once I finished this project, I also created a little bit of piece of code where anybody who wants to make this project can uh, upload their own QR and uh, the, the, the code will automatically generate a pattern for you. Right. Um, so these are my three projects. And I then I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about um, uh, my process of getting the certification because I know that for a lot of uh, people who like produce like circuit boards. I think there's a lot of precedence, um, you know, about how to op how you know what kind of license to use licenses to use and so on. But in my case, I kind of had to figure it out on my own because I don't think I saw I I I don't remember seeing any other project that used yarn uh, and wanted to be you know called hardware. And it was a bit of an experiment for me. So I can share. I wanted to share a little bit of uh, my process. So the first thing I would recommend. So let's say you did try some of these like a process where you kind of try to you know mix two domains, remix some kind of patterns, and you kind of hit that sweet spot. And you think, okay, now I can um, you know. Uh, Call this open source hardware, and I want to, you know, get a certification. So the first thing I would say, recommend is to read the Oshawa community definition of what is open source hardware, because there you can get a lot of clarity of whether your, whether your, you know, whatever you design, you know, qualifies for it or not. 
And the second thing is that I, I would encourage uh, you know to, you to try incorporating locally available materials. Uh, but in the case of yarn, I think that's what makes it special because you can go to any yarn shop and you know get material, and you uh, you can be pretty sure that anywhere it can it will be available anywhere in the world, right? Um, so that's kind of a, a fun thing about yarn. Um, and then uh, you need to be able to choose an open source hardware license for your project, and Oshwa does uh, provide you some approved uh, hardware license. Licenses. In my case, I used CERN OHL, and um, yeah, and in and also if you're using software like, for example, I use Teachable, Teachable Machine, uh, which which is uh, open source. So like, I, I would recommend using open source as much as possible, open source software. And finally, uh, you need to provide documentation uh, online. Uh, it can be really anywhere. And this, but I mean, I was a bit nervous in the beginning because I'm I, I'm not a GitHub user as such. And um, it was a bit of a barrier, you know, like a entry barrier for me. Um, so then I just posted my documentation on Medium, uh, which is like a long format blog post sort of a thing. And and the other thing is you need to grant an open source license for that documentation so other people can use and modify it. So um, yeah, so, uh, and finally, I just wanted to end by saying, yeah, where, where would I go from here? Um, um, so something that I've been working on recently and thinking about is trying to bridge a connection between open source hardware and intangible cultural heritage practices like folk arts and crafts, uh, musical devices, instruments, uh, dance, weaving and braiding. And I want to do this because I think these kind of vernacular intangible practices are, you can find them everywhere in the world. Um, and I think everyone in the world, almost it's kind of a universal thing. Everyone will find a way to relate to them. So I think kind of finding a way to bridge some of these kind of worlds will bring what we would like to see right in the future, equity, diversity, and, and more connections, ecological connections uh, to our practices. Um, so yeah, thank you. Please follow me on Twitter if you're on Twitter. Yeah, I'll end here. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. This is incredible. Some people in the comments said, uh, you know, it's really not that crochet is 3D printing, but with yarn, because crochet came first. So 3D printing is crocheting, but with plastic. Right. <laughs> People are wondering what you're up to next. Um, yeah, um, like I said, um, I, I mean, right, right now I'm focusing on a particular craft form from South India, that's where I'm from. So trying to connect back to my roots and bringing open source hardware into it. Um, so the particular, I mean, this time it's not crochet, it's embroidery. So it's called Banjara embroidery. If anyone's interested, hopefully, I mean, I'll, 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 I think I have some stuff ready um, to kind of work on and uh, yeah. Everybody's super excited to see your stuff. So if Thank you have you. time to chat with them in uh, Discord, I think uh, all they want to see is more of your illustrations and pictures of your work. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.